Good morning and welcome to a special bulletin on the angry astronaut. So quick update for you guys. Um, it appears that uh, I am on my way to Boca Chica soon. That is to say, depending on how things go with the launch preparations, static fire, etc. But I have raised over 80%. Thanks to you guys, 80% of my $1,300 goal to get to Boca. Uh, it is absolutely amazing. I'm about $250 away from that $1,300 milestone. Unreal and once again, far more than I expected given everything else that you guys have done for me in the past. Uh, just amazing. And I don't know what else to say except thank you. Um, really do appreciate it. Um, also, had some issues with Teespring, but the new merch is coming very, very soon. Hopefully today. <laughs> Once again, just had some struggles with that. Also, since Teespring is handling the shipping, there will be no problems as there was with the sunglasses. And for those of you who are waiting on your sunglasses... Well, I know this has been a ridiculous and unacceptably long period of time, but we are finally getting it taken care of. I have a list of all of your names and addresses, everyone that we have missed, unless you haven't emailed it to me. If you haven't, please do that. Um, and then we are going to, or we're in the process rather, of ordering replacement sunglasses for all of you, and then we will ship them using a more reliable courier. This will take a little bit of time, and I know it's been an unacceptable amount of time as it is, but still, we're going to get that wrapped up for you and finally put this whole unpleasant experience behind us. But the sunglasses are very cool, as people who have received them will attest, so I hope it all turns out to be worth it in the end. Let's move on. Grim events taking place in orbit, well, not only in orbit, but also in solar orbit at uh, the location of the James Webb Space Telescope. We've had a malfunction um, that occurred actually way back in the middle of the month, and as of right now, still has not been rectified. This is an instrument that is not inconsequential. Um, it's an instrument that allows us to keep tabs, or rather to make observations of near nearby exoplanets and to observe these exoplanets in great detail, including atmospheric composition, that sort of thing. Losing this instrument is going to be very bad indeed if that if this turns out to be a long-term problem. I'll have more details on that in a moment, but first, a near disaster in low Earth orbit that could have potentially wrecked all of our ambitions, not only in orbit, but anywhere where in the solar system. In a particularly bad neighborhood in low Earth orbit, yes, there are bad neighborhoods, that is to say, areas where there are significant debris generating potential, well, we nearly had a collision that would have created a cataclysmic amount of space debris simply because of the size of the two objects. Both of them were Russian, by the way, one of which was a defunct SL-8 rocket, and the other was the Cosmos 2361 satellite, which is also dead. Cosmos 2361 was launched back in 1998. The SL-8 rocket was decommissioned in 2009, or that was the last time that it was used. It actually entered service in 1964, so we're talking about a rocket that the Russians made use of for a very long period of time. And given the altitude of the orbit, these things are not going to be re-entering our atmosphere for a very long time either. In fact, they're far more likely to crash into something and become a huge cloud of space debris before they actually re-enter our atmosphere. This particular near-miss, however, was painfully close. We're talking only 6 meters or 20 feet. 
Had these two large objects actually collided with one another at a very high rate of speed, by the way, they would have created many thousands of pieces of space debris in a region of space that already is pretty crowded, which most probably would have created at least a small-scale chain reaction of other collisions. This is the sort of event we dare not risk in the future, and yet, according to Leo Labs, an organization that keeps track of these sorts of things, there were no fewer than 1,400 of these kinds of incidents over the course of the last 12 months. Now, none of them were this close, but still, with that many near misses, we are really living on borrowed time. And as I have mentioned a number of times in the past, the UK Space Agency, of all agencies on the planet, we're not talking about a very well-funded space agency here, is taking the lead spending £100 million over the course of the next three years to come up with new types of innovative technologies to mitigate this crisis. However, that's not nearly enough. Much larger space agencies such as NASA, such as Roscosmos, such as China, all of these different agencies need to collaborate to solve this problem before our access to space is cut off by a large-scale chain reaction. I've said it many times in the past, but it is only a matter of time before what happened a few days ago becomes a far more serious incident that impacts the lives of a lot more people besides a few space aficionados and YouTubers like myself. But what about James Webb? What's happening with that? Well, hopefully it's nothing terribly serious. However, since the 15th, a very critical piece of equipment on the telescope has gone out of service. This was the last view that we got of the James Webb telescope before it made its long journey to Lagrange Point 2 orbiting the Sun, a distance of about 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth. This location was ideal for the space telescope simply because it is isolated from our planet from any other heat sources that might interfere with its ability to function and also a very stable location as far as gravity is concerned. It's a parking lot in space, so to speak, where the gravity of the Earth and the Sun tend to balance one another out and anything you place in this location will, for the most part, stay put without requiring a great deal of of maneuvering thruster fuel to keep it in place. That's very important for a telescope that's going to remain out there for years and cannot afford to run out of fuel because we can't service it. And also, if the problem with this instrument turns out to be serious, we can't fix it at this distance. The only way to fix any problems on the telescope is remotely. The instrument in question is the Near Infrared Imager and Slitless Spectrograph, and what it does is reveal cooler red stars and also exoplanets in the near infrared spectrum. Now, that is not a very large portion of the infrared spectrum that James Webb provides information on, but nevertheless, it's incredibly important to our ability to observe exoplanets and other objects that are relatively close to our sun as opposed to most of the objects that James Webb will be observing which are very, very distant. However, the ability to study exoplanets in great detail and the ability to determine their atmospheric composition, well, this is the primary mission of the NIRISS. As a matter of fact, it's already provided provided us some extremely detailed information about nearby exoplanets in the short amount of time that it's been in operation. It's been the crowning achievement of the Canadian Space Agency who designed it and also the Fine Guidance Center, which is combined with the NIRISS, but is a separate instrument, and that, by the way, seems to be doing all right. But if the NIRISS does not come back online, this will have a very serious impact on James Webb's overall mission, at least as far as nearby objects are concerned. Distant objects could still be observed without any significant problems, and it also bears noting that this is not the first problem that James Webb has experienced. The whole telescope went into safe mode for about three weeks in December, 
due to a software fault in its attitude control system, but it came back online without an issue. Also, the telescope's mid-infrared instrument was also briefly non-operational, and they fixed that problem as well. However, it's been two weeks now, and they still haven't been able to restore functionality to NIRISS. There does not appear to be any damage to the equipment, however. It was just an internal communications issue that led to the software timing out. These sorts of things happen with instruments like this, and they can be rectified, but as I said before, it's been two weeks, and they still haven't been able to solve the problem. And anything that goes wrong with this telescope makes me a little bit nervous, and I'm sure the people associated with it even more nervous, because as I've mentioned a number of times in the past, it's impossible to fix this damn thing unless you do it remotely. Fortunately, James Webb was designed with this in mind. It's more than capable of repairing itself without human intervention, at least without direct human intervention, so I have every confidence that this instrument will be back online and providing very detailed and amazing information about the universe around us. Smash that like hit that subscribe. Once again, please check the description for various ways to support my future journeys to Boca Chica and Cape Canaveral. And as always, stay angry about space.